Hello and welcome to The Postcard Professor, where we take complex ideas and explain them in the space of a postcard. In this lesson, we're looking at a pretty standard problem of a rod leaning against a wall. We're going to give this rod an angle theta and a length L. And finally, we're going to make some assumptions to make our life a little easier as we're calculating. So first, we're going to say that all of the contacts are frictionless. Second, the rod is going to be released from rest. So as we're analyzing, we don't have to worry about any initial velocity. And the last is an assumption. It's just a truth that for a long enough rod, the moment of inertia is about 1 12th ml squared. All right, the first step for any problem is to go ahead and draw a free body diagram. The most obvious force is going to be the force of gravity that's pulling down at the center of gravity, which is right in the center of the rod. And then we have two normal forces. These are going to be exactly perpendicular to the surfaces where the contact occurs. So N1, as I'm going to label it, is going to be directly to the right. N2 is going to be directly up. And then we can go and write out these equations as some of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration and we're interested in specifically the acceleration of the center of gravity. So the N1 force is exactly in the I direction. N2 is in positive J. And then the force of gravity is negative J. And we can split up our acceleration into a X term and a Y term. So now we'll split the I and J terms into two separate equations. And now we're going to do a little bit of a systems check we're trying to find a system of equations that has the same number of unknowns and equations so that we can solve it. So right now, we have two equations, and we have four unknowns. Both of the normals are unknown, and both of our accelerations are unknown. So let's try to go ahead and take the sum of the moments and see if that helps us at all. So the sum of the moments is equal to I alpha. The direction that is positive for these depends on how we've drawn our picture. So We've drawn our picture so that an increasing theta causes our rod to rotate in a clockwise direction. So a way of saying that is that we're going to call clockwise rotation positive. This is just a reminder to ourselves so that we don't make any sign mistakes in the future. This N1 force is going to create a positive moment, a clockwise moment. This N2 force is going to cause a negative moment. And the force of gravity is acting straight through the center of gravity, so it doesn't create a moment at all. So this first force, the moment is equal to the force multiplied by the moment's arm. And our moment's arm here is just the y distance from our point to the center of gravity. So looking at theta over here, uh, the y distance is going to be sine theta. The hypotenuse is L over 2. So we end up with L over 2 sine theta. We said the moment from the N2 force was negative, so this is going to be negative N2, and we're looking at the x distance, so this is going to be L over 2 cosine theta, and all of that together is equal to I alpha. All right, so we've added one equation. Unfortunately, we've also added one unknown. We don't know what alpha is either. So adding the moment equation didn't actually help us directly. How are we going to address this unbalance? What we're going to do is try to find a relationship between the two linear accelerations in x and y and this angular acceleration. So writing that in math terms, we're looking for a of x as a function of alpha and a of y as a function of alpha. And remember that this is specifically the acceleration of our center of gravity. So we're going to start from just the position so the x position of the center of gravity as a function of theta and the y position of the center of gravity as a function of theta. Once we have this, we'll take a couple of derivatives. So the xcg from our origin here is equal to L over 2 multiplied by a cosine of theta. And ycg is equal to L over 2 sine theta. So we're going to need to take the time derivative twice in order to find our accelerations. Now, since these are a function of theta, we're actually going to have to use the chain rule here. So just as a refresher, 
the chain rule of a generic function f, we just take the derivative in terms of theta and then multiply that by a d theta dt. But I'm just going to write that as theta dot. And then if we take a second derivative with respect to time, so d squared dt squared of f of theta, the time derivative of df d theta is d squared f d theta squared multiplied by a theta dot, keeping up with our chain rule. But then we multiply that by this other theta dot, so we end up with theta dot squared. And then the other half of our product rule, we're going to take the derivative of theta dot and leave this alone. So in this case, this becomes a df d theta multiplied by theta double dot. And now this theta double dot is exactly our alpha. Theta dot is omega, and we're saying that we are releasing this rod from rest. That means that we can say that omega is equal to zero along with both of our velocities. So this term right here goes to zero, and we don't need to think about it. So we can actually write the acceleration as just df d theta multiplied by alpha. So let's find df d theta for both x and y. So dx d theta is just going to be the derivative of cosine theta multiplied by L over 2. So this becomes a negative L over 2 sine of theta. dy d theta becomes L over 2 cosine theta. All right, now that we have all the legwork behind us, let's go ahead and plug in things over here. For the acceleration in x, we need dx d theta multiplied by alpha. So this becomes negative L over 2 sine theta multiplied by alpha. And the acceleration in y, we just multiply this L over 2 cosine theta times alpha. All right, so now where are we sitting? Well, we've added another two equations, and we haven't added any new unknowns because we already have our accelerations and our alphas in the equation already. So now what we can do is we can plug in these two values, ax and ay, into the sum of the forces equations up above. So we can say that n1 is equal to negative L over 2 sine theta multiplied by m alpha. n2 is equal to the force of gravity plus L over 2 cosine theta times m alpha. And now we can plug all of this into our moments equation. So this first term, we end up with two of these L over 2 sine thetas. So I'm just going to write that as a negative L over 2 sine theta squared multiplied by mass times alpha. Plugging it into, we're going to get an FG term, but I'm going to save that for last. We're going to have a negative L over 2 cosine theta squared multiplied by m times alpha. And then our fg term is going to be minus L over 2 cosine of theta multiplied by mg. And all of this together is going to be equal to i, which is 1 12th ml squared multiplied by alpha. So I'm going to write this as L squared over 12 multiplied by m alpha. Okay, I'm going to have to get a little creative with where I'm putting this, but we have a sine squared and a cosine squared. We'll end up with a negative L squared over 4 m alpha minus this gravity term, L over 2 cosine theta mg. And that's going to be equal to L squared over 12 times m alpha. So we add the L squared over 4 term to both sides. I guess we can go and cancel out our masses. And this becomes an L squared over 3. So L squared over 3 alpha is going to be equal to a negative L over 2 cosine theta multiplied by g. And then we'll do the last bit of math and solve for alpha. So our alpha is going to end up being a negative 3g cosine theta divided by 2 what we see here is that our angular acceleration is negative, which means that theta is going to start decreasing, which is exactly what we expect. If we plug this into our x equation, our x is going to end up being positive, so this is going to move to the right some amount, and our acceleration y is going to be negative. So again, this is going to be moving down, exactly as we expect. 
so the solution makes sense and we are good to go.